So, hey, what's up, guys? It's Mike Frank with Frank Oliver Company, Berkshire Hathaway over here, coming to you to talk a little bit about six ways to win in a bidding war. So, a lot of things that are going on right now, and our buyers are a little frustrated. They want to know what can they do to help their their position as they're looking to negotiate with the seller in multiple offer situations. So, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Before we do, a couple things. So the uh, national average for a 30 year interest rate is actually surprisingly low. The average is 2.87 right now. So um, 2.875 is gonna be a really phenomenal interest rate. When you look historically, if you ask your parents, they probably got locked in somewhere in the 15s back in the 90s, and now we're talking in the low digits, right? So anybody that's getting locked in at three and a half, three and a quarter, 3%, really great rate. We have some people getting locked in at 2.75, 2.5, and really awesome opportunity. So really excited to have the opportunity to bring that to you guys. And obviously always talking about great Ravens wins. Uh, also, you know, we have our pie party coming up in just a couple of weeks. So really excited to have you guys in just a couple of weeks. Come stop by the, the office, drive by for a pie and, uh, you know, share a little bit of Thanksgiving for, for the opportunity. So talking a little bit about six ways to win in a bidding war in this current housing market. So the first thing that we're going to do is super, super simple. Most of you should know this. All of our clients do, of course, but you want to get pre-approved, right? And pre-approved might be a little bit more different, uh, more impactful than pre-qualified, right? Pre-qualified means that you guys have uh, an income. You've talked to a lender. A lender says, what's your credit look like? Ah, oh, you're pre-qualified, right? Pre-approved is going to be a deeper level of communication, right? They're going to take your documents, your paperwork. They're going to pre-approve you for the home loan that you're going to purchase, because nobody wants to go into the house that they want to buy and realize that they need to get their paperwork in order and then a day goes by and then two days go by and three other people have come to that same house and all of a sudden we're in a multiple offer situation before we could even start. So we really do want to try and get that pre-approval and so we can get locked in. So as we say, you can pounce on the house that you really want as soon as you find it, right? So if you got pre-approved on a Monday and you went out showing houses on a Thursday night, you could have an offer written and delivered to the sellers by Friday morning. Time is of the essence, right? Because other buyers are gonna be coming Friday afternoon and Saturday morning and Saturday afternoon in a multiple offer situation. That's gonna be a problem for you that you didn't get your offer in for three or four days, right? The second thing we're gonna talk about is limiting the contingencies. So people often wonder, what is a contingency? And sometimes we get um, some confusion behind what is a contract and what is a contract with contingencies, right? A contingency might be as simple as an appraisal. Or it might be as simple as a lending or a, an inspection situation, right? So if you were to buy a house with a septic or a well, of course you would have multiple contingencies for all the different inspections that you wanted to carry, but that may be only the entry level, right? We may have inspections, we may have inspections with contingency of repair, we may have inspections with no repairs, but then we have the right to terminate the contract, or we could have inspections and no right to terminate the contract at all, or we could have no inspections. We actually just had a buyer that went through and did their inspection before they put their offer in. So they were able to offer the seller no inspections contingencies, no financing contingencies. They decided to make their offer as clean as possible, which really helps as the negotiation process happens, right? We want to show that we have a real strong interest in the property and we're going to make it really easy for the seller that we're not going to be coming back to them and having a whole bunch of problems that we could run into down the road, right? Along with uh, limiting the contingencies, we want to make ourselves flexible on our closing date, especially in today's market. Sometimes sellers are putting their house up on the market before they know where they're headed. So we're going to make ourselves flexible with that settlement date so that the seller can choose when they want to move out of the home. Whether that means that we're going to settle in the end of November or if we're going to settle in mid-December or late December, or even we might make a really competitive offer and settle in mid-November, but then allow the sellers to stay and what's called rent back for a short period of time while they figure out their next steps. So that's an option that you might consider as well to be most uh, committed to the process. Giving the seller an offer they can't refuse, giving them the timeline that they want and the inspections that they want is really, really attractive, maybe even more so than money, right? We want to make sure that the sellers understand our position in the market. And sometimes people do step number four, which is writing a love letter, right? I'm not a huge fan of these. I think that it gets into a position of you versus me. Um, you, the 
buyer that's a police officer versus me, the buyer that's a school teacher. And I think that that gets into a little bit of a conflict of interest. But anytime someone presents it to me, I do forward it on to my sellers and I know it makes an impact. So maybe you consider writing them a love letter, letting them know how much you love their home and what it would mean to go under contract together in an effort to make this transaction work. You want to maybe be vulnerable and share with them your story as to why this is an opportunity for you so that you can really demonstrate the sincerity behind your lack of inspections and your timeline for closing and all of your other things. You want to be able to make an offering that shows the seller more than the number on the page right? That's super important. And going back to that number, right? That offer price, which everyone thinks is the most important thing. Maybe we want to use an escalation clause and an escalation clause is going to be a clause that says, I'm going to pay $500,000 for your house. But if somebody else comes in paying 510, I'll pay 512 or I'll pay 515 or I'll pay 511, whatever that number looks like up to 525,000. That's my max. Right? So you're going to create an escalation where you'll escalate over another buyer in the same marketplace, thus creating a differentiating factor between you and of course, potential other buyers, right? So we're talking a little bit about price. And while we're on the subject, something that people always think is, well, cash is king. Cash is king. Nobody's going to walk away from a briefcase full of money, but a briefcase full of money with a whole bunch of contingencies really doesn't matter. Right? A briefcase full of money that's $485,000 when I have a conventional loan that's offering five hundred and twelve. dollars well, they're going to walk away with a briefcase full of money at settlement as well. So your briefcase full of money versus their briefcase full of money, but it's coming in a financing contingency, might not actually be as king as people think. So don't let it be deceptive where you're getting into a position saying, hey, I'm so great, I don't need to be competitive. I'm so great, I don't need to deal with these other things or these other finance members. Maybe we wanna consider that there are other people that are paying so much more that the graciousness of the difference is enough to outweigh the balance, right? So as we're considering price, as we're considering financing, all of those things do come into play. But the number one thing that I tell all of my buyers is that you have to make sure that you're protecting yourself and for your family. Right. So if you're making an offer on that five hundred thousand dollar home and you couldn't stomach the thought of going over five hundred and ten thousand, don't. I don't care what you're bringing to the table. I don't care what the cash buyer is bringing to the table. I don't care what the other family wrote in their love letter. If you go to five hundred and fifteen thousand, you're going to be mad and you're going to be upset and you're going to feel regretful and remorseful for your whole life. Don't ever push yourself to a limit that's uncomfortable. Sometimes being a competitive offer is the opportunity for you to say it wasn't meant to be. How often do we say that in our daily lives? And yet in real estate, people feel like it's got to happen. It wasn't meant to be is such a powerful position to say that we made a really great offer and it just didn't work out. And maybe next time we take a little bit back and we learn a little bit from it and we raise our sales price or we lower our sales price or we lower our expectations or we change our approach. Maybe we don't get inspections, whatever it might take to be competitive, but you've got to really feel it. Right. And the last thing that we're going to talk about is don't count yourself out. So something that a lot of people forget is that the failure rate on contracts in today's market is about seven, uh, sorry, 30%, which means about 70% of the time transactions are going to settlement. And about 30% of the time in a competitive market like this, we're seeing problems and transactions falling apart all over the place. It happens because buyers get cold feet. It happens because the sellers don't feel obligated to make home inspections repairs or fix the well issue that happened in one house, right? We want to make sure that we understand that the opportunity is there for that house to come back to the market. So don't fall in love with it and don't say, I'm just going to wait to see what happens. But don't count yourself out. Make sure that your agent is following up and following through to ensure they have your offer, to ensure the offer was presented, to ensure that all of your terms were conveyed clearly and concisely. And finally, to make sure that the property is actually following through, that step one is going to move to step two, which is going to move to step three, which is going to move to settlement. And if there's ever an opportunity, your agent is there to say, hey, my clients are still interested if your seller wants to terminate this contract right? That's a big part of what we do in a competitive offer situation is we're not just going, ah, never mind, and pushing it off the ledge. We're actually staying involved and saying this could be a really good opportunity for our clients. So things that you want to remember is that there are ways to be competitive. There are ways to set yourself apart. 
ultimately what you need to do is the best thing for you and for your family. Make sure you're making the best decision. You're not pushing yourself to a limit that's uncomfortable and you want to make sure that you're focused on the thing that's going to help you guys move forward. In the meantime, I'll talk to you guys soon and I look forward to next week. Thanks for watching. Make sure you like and subscribe for weekly content. Also, check out our social media pages. The links are in the description below. See you next week.